All right, welcome back everybody to our next session for the day. We are day two into our conference, Sea Change, Life, Worlds and Ecological Upheaval. This is the 39th annual conference for the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness, but our first fully virtual one. It's been a wild and fascinating ride so far. Uh, a quick land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you today from Portland, Oregon, which rests on the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalupua, Malala, and many other tribes and bands. As the original caretakers of this land, we wish to uh, begin our time by acknowledging their presence, their dignity, their continued struggle for respect, restoration, and reparations. I'm here today because they were here first. I'm here today speaking to you because they were displaced from this land, and it is the goal of this organization to do our part to help rectify that through these sorts of dialogues. Uh, a couple of quick uh, announcements about the functionality for attendees. We are in a Zoom webinar, which means that only the presenters have their microphones and their cameras on. If you want to interact with us and or the, pre uh, the presenters, please do so via the chat window. Please turn that on as soon as you can, because we're also going to be posting a lot of information in there about um, upcoming sessions and other things about the conference. And so have that chat window open. We had a very lively chat discussion in the last session. And so it's a great opportunity to kind of speak with one another and post ideas and things that come up as you're listening to the presenters. For questions, we would like it if you would roll over that Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, and put your questions there. The reason is, is because the presenters can see them and work with them and we can as well. If you post them in the chat box, which is fine, uh, there's a chance we'll miss them because so much else is coming up in the chat box. And so try to get the questions in the Q&A and if they end up in the chat, that's fine. There is a live transcript button right next to that, right to the right of that. And that will give you these very imperfect um, uh, 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 transcript for folks that need, to, need that. It is not, it is distracting for some, so you can not turn it on or you can turn it off. Um, and if it's helpful for you, go ahead and turn that on, but that is there as an option for you as well. Uh, the last thing I'd like to mention, and then we'll get going, is that um, if you would do two things, if you click on participants as well, you'll see a list of all the folks participating and it'll be broken up into panelists or attendees. It might not be on your screen, but if you can find your name and do one thing for us, make sure that it is exact or as close as possible to the name that you've registered for the conference, this is why we're not here to kick anybody out, but we just want to kind of keep tabs on who's in the room um, so we can uh, have an awareness of that. And then secondly, you'll notice some of us have added our pro preferred pronouns to our name. You can do that by clicking to the right of your name and clicking rename and adding that. That's by no means a requirement, but it makes the space a little more accessible uh, and diverse uh, for everyone involved in safe space. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to our conference coordinator, Mark Flanagan, who's going to kick us off with this session. Thanks so much, Andy, and welcome, everyone. We really appreciate you being here. My name is Mark Flanagan. I am the uh, program chair, and I've had the delight of reading all of these abstracts um, for today's panel. Uh, today's panel is called Resistance and Reclamation, Indigenous People's Responses to the Changing Ecology some really um, fascinating dialogue that will come out of this. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over uh, to Micah, uh, who will be introducing participants, perhaps saying a little bit more about the panel itself. So thank you so much. And um, we are grateful to have you here. Thank you, Mark and Andy. Um, I'm the vol volunteer chair for this, this panel, which was sort of put together from different papers. It wasn't organized as such in the beginning. so. Uh, but I, but I think it's I think the organizers did a pretty good job of putting us all in this space, and I'm interested in seeing the dynamics that that come up as we go through our papers and have discussion. Um, so that the title of this panel is Resistance and Reclamation: Indigenous Peoples' Responses to the Changing Ecology, um, looking recognizing unprecedented changes in global and local environments, um, changes caused uh, many caused by other humans that have impacted disproportionately indigenous persons. Um, and we're exploring here a variety of indigenous responses or resurgences, you might say, to change, uh, ranging from Siberian shamanic responses to climate change. This will be by um, Dr. Marjorie uh, Bowser, um, to uh, Native American resistance to the Dota Dakota Access Pipeline, um, to Khmer rites and rituals designed to balance ecological disruption, and then indigenous reflections on disruption and chaos, chaos during um, COVID-19 
Um, and I'll just eat, briefly introduce each panelist as we go through, uh, through the, the session. So our very first panelist is Dr. Marjorie mandelstam Balzer, a research professor at Georgetown University and a faculty fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. Um, and the paper is entitled Climate Crises, Ecological Upheaval and Shamanic Worldviews in Siberia and Yukon. So please take it away, Dr. Balzer. Hi, um, and thank you for the introduction. I have got a little bit of a title change and uh, um, can everyone hear me? Is this working? Yes. So let yes, me yeah. let me uh, explain. Uh, my title is Climate Crises and Shamanic Worldviews in Siberia and Beyond. Uh, I'm going to be doing a little bit of comparing with Amerindian issues, but not as much as I'd originally planned. And my nickname for the title is Fires, Bears, and it was Disoriented Spirits until I consulted with some uh, Sahav friends and colleagues, and they said, no, no, it's the humans who are disoriented, not the, not the spirits. So uh, that we can consider as a, a kind of a prob problematic issue to perhaps return to. Um, let me begin by saying that the devastations of climate crises have snared and particularly affected indigenous peoples worldwide, including especially in the Arctic and subarctic. And my talk focuses on wide ranging ramifications of development disconnections, animal human relationships in Siberia, with some comparisons to Amerindian communities. Forest fires and floods and I'm, yes, floods. Let me get back to the flood. The uh, fires have been increasing, spring, spring flooding on the rise, uh, and forest fires, floods, bears, birds, spirits have been playing leading roles. While the observations and dramatic narratives featured here may appear eclectic, I'm arguing that at least some of their underlying logics and interconnections converge. I begin with one of the many seemingly miraculous narratives of, of the Saha Shaman Nikon from the Soviet period. Uh, let me show you Nikon. I'm not getting my slideshow clean. Let me try this. Well, I think we're going to live with a, uh, some side pictures at, as well. My, my Nikon uh, narrative, it comes from this man here, uh, who I'm hoping you can see at least a little of. He practiced healing in other shamanic arts in secret for a wide circle of community members he trusted. One day, Nikon was visited by agitated local Communist Party officials, not his usual supplicants, but people who were themselves Saha, also called Yakut, and they were quite desperate because a nearby village was threatened with an out of control forest fire. Although they did not have much hope, they begged him to please try to put out the fire which is threatening a nearby village. He offered them tea and went outside to fetch some water. When he came back with a hot kettle, they were beside themselves. Don't help us. It's more important to put out the fire. Don't fret, he answered. I've already sent a rain cloud over the area and it's raining there now. Well, what had he done? According to my Saha interlocutors, he had gone into a kind of controlled trance without using a drum or a full science, and certainly without shamanic regalia. He'd managed to contact animal helper spirits, one of whom was probably a bear who brought on the much needed rain. By 2002, Nikon's protege, Fedot, aided by Nikon's spirit, was already said again to douse a forest fire near the village of Jimkon with hailstone in the nick of time. And here it was, it was more public knowledge that this had happened. Whether we take such narratives literally or not, several interpretations and ramifications follow. At minimum, such stories, and I'm problematizing the issue of the word story as the panel before me did as well, told as valid history, valorized shamanic worldviews, and they discredit Soviet propaganda and the officials who spouted it. They help to explain why Siberians are fascinated by but concerned about unintended side effects of seeding rain clouds using airplanes. 
As elsewhere, the connection between shamanic actions and weather control has been affirmed or more often rumored by Saha through many generations. Shamans who brag about such powers were and are said to lose their abilities. The value of shamanic modesty about their attunement with nature was and is key to their spiritual success. Crucially, in the Saha language, the word for nature, al has its root in the word spirit. In 1992, the late shaman Vladimir Kandakov, who you see on the screen, founder of the Association of Folk Medicine, ruefully con confessed to me that he had once been attuned to weather patterns and their electrical currents. Once a gentle rain had briefly consecrated his opening prayer at a summer solstice festival ceremony. At another time, his spirit connections were able to divert heavy rain clouds from a ceremony that he was about to perform. But after he boasted that he had stayed off the, staved off the rainstorm, he was never able to do it again. Further consideration brings us deeper into the realm of spiritual connections with nature and the need to suspend judgments that juxtapose scientific reality to miracles. In this interpretation, shamanic spiritual connectedness is a phenomenon that may well earn belated scientific explanation and accompanying terminology in the future but has for centuries been dismissed and denigrated as superstition, demonic, or at best, a parallel but lesser traditional knowledge system. A salient indication that traditional ecological knowledge, teak, might converge with scientific, systematic, and logical experimentation and observational approaches comes from what we're learning about the interconnections of trees, their undergrowth, their canopies, and this has been made famous by the under and over stories of ecologist Suzanne Simard and brought to life in the novel of Richard Powers. To preview my conclusions, ecological and cosmological explanations work at different levels in various times and synergistic circumstances. Acknowledging this makes the possibility of open-minded convergence of scientific and indigenous worldviews plausible. Such conversions may be crucial for healing ourselves and mitigating disaster in our Anthropocene, Anthropocene times of rapidly saturating climate crises. Let me get now more into the contemporary ecology in Siberia. A countrywide fire ban in the so-called Federation of Russia, augmented in 2015 after disastrous fires in Caucasia, shows the extent to which local knowledge of ecological systems has been suppressed in favor of general rules that reveal misunderstanding about indigenous fire care and logics. In the Sahara Republic, for example, in Oymya Khan, a competitor for the coldest inhabited place on earth, local Saha and Evian have long used their refined observations of spring weather patterns to burn taiga areas near forests with minimal danger and maximal use of safe, wet conditions. And I'm getting a lot of this from the scientific data of my friend and colleague, indigenous uh, scholar Vera Solovyova. This has helped prevent notorious zombie fires. Now, I did not make up this term, couldn't have made it up that can spread even in winter, smoldering under the taiga, erupting uncontrollably in summer, especially in areas where brush has accumulated. Without appropriate controlled, culturally sanctioned burns, and with the acceleration of climate change exacerbated by arson, plenty of it, and greed, fires in Siberia have been particularly destructive in the past several years. This in turn has contributed to destruction of pastures for horses and cattle, depression of village economies, an exodus of youth from the villages to regional centers and the capital of Saha Republic, Yakutsk. Now, while modern post-Soviet indigenous people in villages and towns do not universally acknowledge shamanic worldviews, significant proportions of them have inherited and absorbed shamanic concepts, spiritual concepts that make them receptive to to traditional ecological knowledge, including adaptation legacies. An important indicator of this has been the rising popularity of Saha Shaman Ejedora Kobyakova, and here she is, um, 
she's tall, imposing, yet kind. She plays sort of the, the part of an earth mother priestess. And since her first shamanic illness at age 11, she has acquired numerous mediator spirits for different purposes in various cosmological contexts. These include birds, swan, crane, cuckoo, loon, woodpecker, and for the upper world, and elk and bull for the middle earth, and bass and duck for the watery underworld. She explains that she taps into the natural interconnectivity of humans, flora, and fauna. Her teacher, teachings encourage Saha to literally acknowledge their roots, since when each human is born, they're said to be linked in spirit to a gendered tree and animal, often a bird living in that person's homeland. This is my system, she says. Those who come to me for cures have special protection that derives from their land and their kin, their ancestors. And here on the screen, you see a, a screenshot from Edge Dora, Elder Sister Dora's 2021 New Year Renewal Address. So she uh, adapted in the time of COVID and through YouTube to her followers, she put out a blessing that many people truly appreciated. She has a poetic refrain during the blessing that says all of nature, meaning all of nature and spirits. She emphasizes the Sahar one with nature and an integral part of it, a very um, normal part of what she says as she talks about being children of nature. We must be grateful to the keeper of nature, she says, Bayanai. May Bayanai help you, may you preserve yourself, your land, and in your locality, may you cherish observance, specific local observances of Sir Tuam, which is a kind of word for belief ritual system. We must give offerings, we must feed the grandmother, meaning Ebe, the river, and the fire spirit. We must pray for curing of Saha at sacred places. This season sensitive renewal through a 30 minute blessing was meant to raise Saha consciousness and to arouse Saha to practice traditional ecological values, including not sinning against nature. The next slide is uh, Dora with uh, a, a supplicant. Uh, and I want to go on to say that such values have been long integrated into Saha and other indigenous Siberian practices and rituals related to the gathering of herbs. And my, my next slide is of Alexandra Konstantinova Chirkova from the northern town of Belaya Gora. She's a healer, shaman, surgeon. I have gone herbal, medicinal herb hunting with her in the forests um, near the town of Belaya Gora. And each time we bent to gently remove a plant, we observed a moment of silence and gratefulness while offering a token gift, such as a coin or a ribbon. Alexandra would speak a Saha prayer of thanks quietly each time. And as in many indigenous community contexts, Alexandra chose only plants that were flourishing, leaving plenty of their kin behind and never taking more than absolutely needed for sustainability. Alexandra is the daughter of a famous Saha shaman, Constantine, who I've written about a lot. Uh, she, he, he, he practiced what Joan Coscioino and I have called radical empathy. Um, Many of the values that are communicated through admiration for Constantine and through Alexandra have also been particularly elaborately expressed and somewhat secretly expressed by northern hunters. In Saha, Iven, and Yukagir traditions, they are mostly associated with male rituals, with a few notable female and transgender exceptions in times of hardship. After killing, whether by gunshot or trapping, each animal expects and needs to be thanked and appeased in order for its soul to be willing to return to Earth. In some cases, the animal is given a nose rub offering of grease or a drink of water, along with soul journey prayers. The concept of animal reincarnation facilitated through appropriate ritual is widespread in the circumpolar North. It reached its apogee in bear ceremonies. There are very special animals that aren't supposed to be killed, but many of those who are not in this category are indeed animals that are perceived to be willing to give themselves up to an appropriately respectful supplicant. 
In some, my indigenous interlocutors emphasize a kindred interconnectivity of flora, animals, and humans that's being threatened by short-sighted regimes of land management insensitive to hard-earned observation-based traditional ecological knowledge. In the Saha and Evian communities of the Verkhoyansk region, serious contempt is expressed for outsiders who come to hunt for sport, sometimes shooting elk and wild deer from hired helicopters. So let me turn now briefly to Amerindian spiritual comparisons, and my title for this section is called All My Relations. In Alaska and Canada's Yukon, similar tensions and hunting sensitivities abound, compounded by climate change, increased out of control forest fires, and fear of energy development on sacred grounds, such as the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, home to the Gwich'in. As famed Gwich'in elder Sarah James has insisted, we're caribou people. Caribou are not just what we eat, they are who we are. They are in our stories, our songs, and the whole way we see the world. Caribou are our life. Without caribou, we wouldn't exist. This came up also in the grief, uh, Ecology Grief Cafe yesterday as well. I want to feature a story here. Indigenous anthropologist Paul Nadasti, in his very special essay, The Gift in the Animal, explains his own story that a wounded rabbit injured but escaped from one of his snares in the Yukon five days later appeared at his doorstep miles away willing him to kill it was this an uncanny prescience was it a case of animal human rapport tinged with mutual pain and regret Nadasti sees the relationships of hunters and other than human persons as one of continual reciprocity, far from merely symbolic, metaphorical, or anomalous. One should not think of the animal as suffering, but as a gift that requires thanks. And he sincerely gave that thanks, looking in the eyes of the rabbit in his arms that he needed to kill. Nadasti's confessions of the rabbit encounter elicited recent, not mythic, encount explanations of people still alive today who had met animals in the bush who began speaking to them in Indian language. Some recalled Athabascan and Cree stories that were warnings, foretellings of death. The valid warning Nadasti draws from his experience is that we as anthropologists should be neither embarrassed nor silent about such seemingly extraordinary experiences we don't easily understand in Euro-American frameworks. This is not romanticism, but necessary for pragmatic mutual respect and fair-minded anthropological knowledge attainment. Returning to the theme of climate change crises, including runaway fires and droughts and floods, we can reality check what other Canadian First Nations representatives are saying. By 2020, Indigenous an indigenous coalition on climate action was created with a public statement heralding Yukon First Nations declare climate emergency. Let me turn now to my conclusions. My personal alarm concerning climate change went off after witnessing a boat from a boat, the excruciating beautiful calving of a glacier in Alaska in 2009. Later that summer, EAC friends, already devastated by the Exxon Valdez oil spill disaster, expressed further fears of mining, pollution ruining their salmon on the Copper River. They also worried about greenhouse gas emissions stoking climate change and curtailing their way of life. I shared a sublime moment with EAC leader Dune Lankard on the screen when an eagle swooped near us over Cordova Bay to catch midair a salmon bone skeleton that Dune had just tossed. Dune himself looked amazed. He was my salmon gutting teacher at that moment. He said he had never seen and had such an elegant communication and communion with an eagle. And my clan is eagle, he said. He wondered how long it would last. So for final framing, imagine a continuum where numerous mitigation management schemes might be arrayed on, on a kind of juxtaposition to indicate human efforts to adapt to climate change. 
Toward one end would be diverse indigenous concepts of traditional ecological knowledge, acknowledging the critical need for seasonal harmony, respect, and integration with nature. At the other end will be big science and big business solutions, including shooting the sky with reflective particles, the so-called white sky approach, wind and solar energy, as well as carbon offset agreements based on the 2021 Restored Paris Agreement might be somewhere near the center, the mainstream of public interest. While not all compatible, many management possibilities could be explored simultaneously. Indigenous worldviews must not be left behind in our rush to create mega breakthroughs, Bill Gates's term. We lose indigenous locally based eco-cosmological wisdom at our peril. We ignore the voices of indigenous healers, hunters, and land stewards at our own risk. And I know I'm preaching to the converted here. Shamanic worldviews that animate human animal rapport sustain the logics of controlled burns and valorize the interconnectedness of broadly defined living multiverses could have mitigated some of the worst disasters already apparent, such as runaway and zombie fires, Arctic heat waves, glacier shrinkage, and unprecedented floods. At stake is not only our basic human rights principle that indigenous peoples have advocated from the UN to local community planning commissions, nothing about us without us. Also at stake are our hopes for indigenous scientific cooperation on climate change that could enhance the difficult process of making our struggling earth safe for future generations. And here, let me end just with a picture of a sacred mountain ceremony on top of the Tuimata Valley in Saha Republic with a white shaman making fire offerings and young next generation participants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowser, um, for a very interesting paper. Let us move on to the second speaker in this panel. And this is Dr. Lisa Arensen. Uh, assistant Professor at the University of Brunei in Jerusalem in Southeast Asia. And the paper is entitled Cooling the Land, Environmental Solastalgia and Spirit Worlds on the Kulin Plateau in Cambodia. So please take it away without further ado, Dr. Arensen. Thank you, Micah. I'm going to share my screen. So as Micah just said, my, um, my talk is based in Cambodia and it's based on the Kulin Plateau. That is a um, national park in Siem Reap province, about 60 kilometers north of Siem Reap city. And within the national park are nine um, formal and informal settlements, some of them with very long standing roots. This is an inset of the back southeast part of the mountain where the four villages that I'll be talking about today are located. And you can see from this Google Earth data that the landscape is highly agricultural. Even though it's a national park, it's also been a worked agricultural landscape for centuries. And there's a, a fair amount of ongoing conflict between conservation actors and local residents about agricultural practices and conservation. Um, so I've actually done research on the mountain with these communities for six years. But what I'm gonna be reflecting on um, this evening, sorry, morning in North America, is um, some research I was privileged to be able to do last year in 2020 because I was in Cambodia throughout the pandemic. Um, and it's based on six weeks in 2020. Um, and what I'm interested in from an analytical perspective is I've been thinking recently about the term or the condition of solastalgia. And a very quick summary for those of you who may not be familiar with this, this is a condition that, a term that was coined by an Australian environmental philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, um, in 2003 and 2004, that has been taken up by a number of disciplines as a way of thinking about ecological grieving. Um, it is a term to describe place-based distress when a landscape is transformed or destroyed and people living within it feel that they are, um, have lost identity and control. You can see, I'll just call your attention to the second paragraph where he says, loss of place leads to loss of sense of place. Um, it hasn't been used that much by anthropologists yet. Um, and most of the studies so far, case studies done on this, have actually been with post-industrial societies, uh, many of them in Australia. 
And one, one anthropological critique has been inviting people writing about solastalgia to make sure that they have a deep focus on the sense of place that in these um, ideas, what is the sense of place that's being lost? So what I'm going to do in my talk is um, give you the case study of some things happening on Kulen Mountain and then come back in my discussion section to whether solastalgia is perhaps a useful or relevant term to understand these events or not. Um, so what is the potential sense of place for the residents of Gulen? It's an extremely complex and multi-layered question and I'm going to give you an extremely brief um, insight into that. This is a photograph taken by a French, um, I think he was actually an ethnobotanist, um, shortly before Khmer Rouge gained control of the area. And this photograph shows the only access road to the mountain from the Angkorian period until just a few months ago. Um, it's also important to recognize that the Gulen Plateau was actually the site of the first Angkorian city, Mahadran Parvata. So even back in the eighth and ninth century, the Gulen Plateau was a worked landscape. And traces of that ancient archeological heritage remain for people in the landscape today, both as ruins and as inscriptions um, and some bas relief carvings, as you can see in the photograph that are scattered across the plateau. The Gulen Mountain, the site of the national park is the most sacred site in all of Cambodia, particularly for Khmer people, which is the dominant ethnic group in Cambodia. And the site is highly sacred in terms of Brahmanism from the Angkorian period, Theravada Buddhism from the modern and contemporary period, and also in strong um, animist and local and national traditions. And that is linked to the presence of what I am going to call earth beings. And by saying earth beings, I'm following the usage of the anthropologist Marisol de la Cadena, who writes about Andean cosmopolitics. Um, a term used to refer to large sentient forces, often associated with mountains and hills. Um, Angkor, sorry, Gulen Plateau is still visited by um, many local tourists and as well as being a pilgrimage site. And living on the sacred mountain in the sacred landscape for the villagers, any material, any transformation of the material landscape has implications for the landscape of the spirit world. Um, so this is all me messing about with Google Earth, but this is a quick look at the secular topography for you. Um, I, north, you can see at the bottom of my screen is, this is actually facing, mm, northwest is to the upper left. Um, and you can see that there is a ring road separating the villages around the top of the plateau. There's also a sacred topography that will be very familiar. This is um, zooming in slightly to one of the villages called Sankailat. And I've marked with, um, um, can you see my cursor? Google Earth markers, three spirit shrines which are visible in the landscape. Anyone can drive by and see them and local people would make offerings at those. Um, there are tutelary spirits for the villages that have permanent shrines in or next to the village. And this is images from one of those. But during my most recent research on Gulen, um, our interlocutors told us that there's actually a very complex, unseen, invisible topography around this as well. And this is called the world of the Arupai. Um, this is a Khmer term that sort of means the unseen or the invisible. So I'm just going to translate it as invisible for now. And um, this is a fantastic map. I made it without any reference to actual events or places that people took me to. It just represents the different kinds of sacred landscape elements that my interlocutor, interlocutor shared with me. So there's some polygons on here and these represent potential wild spirit sites. This one here is an actual one. The other two are just three are imaginary. People said you also must be careful to not accidentally um, build upon or try to cultivate spirit roads, which are represented by these orange lines I've made. They also mentioned it is forbidden to be along Angkorian ancient roads, which may be visible or invisible. And they also mentioned another category, which was the idea of the water road. Um, similar, a similar concept to canals. They said there are invisible water roads that are being sailed, the spirit world are actually sailing upon 
in Sampo. And Sampo is a Khmer term for like a small Chinese boat. This slide comes from somewhere else entirely. Okay, so my interlocutors explained that if you as a human bisect or hit against sacred objects and sites in the spirit world, there is often a consequence, often an accident or an illness for the person who has committed those acts of trespass. And this is a diagram that a traditional healer drew in the dust to explain to us how you might accidentally enclose a spirit road with the boundary of your farm, which would lead to um, consequences for you down the road. Sorry. There is a variety of ritual specialists on the mountain who assist in diagnosing and um, helping with sacred trespass. And here in this diagram, I've just mentioned three of these categories. Again, I, there's not much time in this talk, so I won't get into their different roles, but there are diviners, mediums, and a kind of ritual practitioner called the Kru Sada, which literally translates as the guru who blows wind. And this healer often leads rituals at the site of the trespass to try and cool the earth. Um, in the photograph, the Kru Sada of Sankalat village is the man who is crouched behind the woman. She is the village medium. And he's actually chanting in Pale and blowing on her to protect her before she attempts to channel a wild forest spirit in a healing ritual. So until quite recently, the road between the villages on the mountain has been in um, disrepair for a very, very long time. And the mountain has been very isolated from lowland Siem Reap and lowland um, Cambodia mm, for centuries, actually. Um, something I forgot to mention earlier is that about three generations back, there was quite a bit of intermarriage between Khmer inhabitants of the mountain and the indigenous, pe indigenous people group known as the Gui, who live in Northern Cambodia. And agriculture on the mountain has traditionally been Swidden rotating agriculture, which is very uncommon for Khmer people, but quite common in Cambodia for highland indigenous people. The road has been something that people of the mountain have had to struggle with for a very long time and has made it quite difficult for trade and getting to clinics and schools. Currently, there is a large road project under construction that was approved by the government and is funded by a large private company. And as well as widening and improving the road across the plateau, the original road, they've actually made an entrance from the Eastern Lowlands, which is the first time in history that there is vehicle access going up to the east side of the plateau. And this is a photo of that road from the top. In order to make the new road and widen the old road, the company dynamited boulders and bulldozed down trees along the edges of the old road. These are all acts of massive material alteration of the landscape. The new road is still under construction after the bulldozing. It very slowly goes through several phases towards a solid cement block. There is no, um, what's the word in American? There's no detours. Locals and outsiders have continued to use the road as it is the only road, even while construction is ongoing. Um, so what I briefly want to talk about is accidents happening during this construction period. Um, and on this Google Earth project, I've just marked three accident incident sites. I'm gonna speak very briefly about the two that are marked in red. So the first, first deaths connected to the road happened in 2019. Um, they actually happened on the Eastern Access Road, the new road, when a minivan with Chinese tourists visiting Siem Reap. It was um, illegally traveling on the road. It was not yet open for the public. And they veered off the road and the minivan rolled and there ended up being three deaths from the incident. From the perspective of the local mountain people and the um, a local medium, the incident had actually been caused by the minivan disturbing a sleeping niak under the earth. And the niak or the naga in other parts of Southeast Asia is a kind of large serpent dragon. So local people explained that the new road had gotten cut quite close to the subterranean cave of the sleeping naga. And when the minivan veered off the corner of the road, they accidentally pressed down upon the sleeping dragon, which rolled in its sleep, hence rolling the van and leading to the death of 
to be tourists. And some ceremonies were held on the spot and some shrines were erected there. And the dragon was asked to move away from its home to deeper under the mountain. Um, an accident that hit quite a bit closer to home happened unfortunately on the first day of January in 2020 when a mother who was traveling home from the only health clinic on the mountain with all three of her children on her moped was hit and killed by another local villager who was drunk at the time of the collision. This accident happened between two of the old villages on the mountain. And it led to a massive outpouring of grief and concern by local families who need to travel this road every day on their way to the clinic and to schools. Um, Buddhist monks came in and, and conducted ceremonies for the souls of the dead who had died violently, but also a mountain medium, and she is the character in the bottom left-hand side of this frame. Um, she's called Nye Ngum, which means Grandmother Ngum. She ended up channeling a wild forest spirit who was concerned about the accident, and the three village chiefs decided to try to host a ceremony where they would make a new spirit shrine for the wild forest spirit, and ask if the wild forest spirit would come and protect the road. Now this forest spirit was formerly unknown to the villagers. They did not know its name or its history until they talked to the medium while she was in her trance. The ceremony was held directly on the accident site where the mother and one of the children had died. Um, and members of the community came and participated. In part of the ceremony, the medium went into a trance and danced in the spirit and blessed local people. And he was renamed from Tapi, who was said to have been an Angkorian military general, to Tasok, which is, means grand, literally means grandfather of safety. And in addition to asking him to change his name, he was asked by the villagers to change his very modality of dwelling, to come out of the forest and the wild space, to move to the road, live in a shrine, and to protect the human inhabitants of that place. So the shrine is still next to the road and it is tended regularly by local villagers. Um, which leads me to my discussion. In this photograph, Yingam is dancing in the spirit and you can see a lot of local children are gathered around watching. So the question that this brings me to is whether traditional ritual practice on the mountain is able to encompass and enfold the altered landscape and its accompanying dangers. And what I want to do now is for the last three minutes, and then I'll just take one more minute to finish up, is actually play you some thoughts on this matter by my Khmer research assistant, Sun Sopet. Um, we taped this earlier in the day because it is two in the morning in Cambodia. Okay, um, so Pat, thank you so much for being willing to join me for a minute. Um, to all of you listening to us, Sun Sok Pat is my research assistant, and we've been doing research together for two years, and we worked together on the mountain three times. And so Pat, you've been really important as my research assistant and a translator for my students and as a cultural broker for all of us. And I know you were not there the week of the accident, but you've helped us do a lot of our research on spirit beliefs. And I'm very happy that you have agreed to share your thoughts about a couple of questions. Um, so the first question is, what do you think is the relationship between the development project of the road construction and the world of the invisible world that we call the Arokbai and Khmai? Do you think they do affect each other? Thank you, Nekru Lisa. Thank you for having me for today. Um, yes, regarding to the question, um, I do think that there is relationship in the uh, development project um, with the Arupe on the mountain. It's because um, I think um, the mountain lands, like Kulen Mountain, is the most sacred um, mountain in Cambodia. And people who live on the mountain, they are believing in unseen, so many unseen things that living in the world because um, through their ancestor, they already born and been practicing um, Arupai 
um, from the beginning. So connecting to develop development um, project that happening now in on Kulen Mountains, it's it's um, um, very important to um, uh, connect the people um, to get involved in the pro uh, development project um, because uh, want it or not in developing world, they might not think about what happened around that area, but people who live there, they are affected um, if they don't act right to um, what they're believing. For example, if they are um, moving the rock or um, start to enlarge the road, it affects too many uh, three many rock that most of people living there, they think it's, there is a spirit who protecting them. So if they the developing um, working on the side, but not really respect of what people believing on the mountain, it would be affect their their life because mm -hmm. they they feel like the area would be cursed by the spirit because they didn't follow their tradition. So on 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 the other side of my my opinion, because I grow up in in the city. Yeah. Um, we, we, of course, we still do ceremony. For example, if you want to um, um, build a house, you still have an offer for their lands. And um, this is what I witnessed in the lowland as I grow up in Phnom Penh. But for the people in the mountain, they are more, uh, they are more believer um, on the Arupe. So of course, I believe that there is connection between um, developing country, and the, the out of way, especially on the mountain. Mm. Okay, and so I will just end there. Um, and I think it's interesting, you know, the name of our panel is Resistance in Reclamation. And I think what's interesting in these case studies is that the actor showing resistance was the um, earth dragon rolling over under the earth when the weight of the car pressed down upon it. But in the second example, the spirit came to the scene afterwards expressing concern and then these complex and new rituals were made asking this wild forest spirit to be reconciled with a domesticated lifestyle to protect the people from the road and the new dangers that go with it. Um, I think it's worth mentioning people are very positive about the potential benefits of the road, but of course they're also terrified of the dangers that it brings. Um, and I believe I'll stop there. Thank you all very much and we'll take questions at the end. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, now it's uh, now I will. It's my turn to present. Uh, let me just set this up here. Share my screen. Okay. Okay, I think we'll have a lot of um, interesting things to discuss in the Q and A session. A lot of cross um, paper. Um, so I am I'm Michael Morton. I am teaching um, anthropology and Southeast Asian studies at Northern Illinois University, um, and the title of this talk is Ancestral Presences. I amended a little bit here, indigenous and non-indigenous reflections on the arts of living and dying in the restorative age of COVID-19. Um, the image you see here on the slide is essentially, um, this is an indigenous Aka master ancestral genealogy picture, uh, which is part of a neo-traditionalist faction of Aka who are um, engaged in an active sort of indigenous resurgence movement, a cultural revitalization movement or vitalization movement, I would almost prefer that language rather than revitalization. Um, and it, it speaks to some of the issues I'll be talking about in, in this particular context. These are the names of the sort of um, primal ancestral figures within that, that sort of connect together the larger community of some 700,000 Aka residing throughout various parts of Southeast Asia and Southwest China. Um, the, the sort of blue tiles on the bottom represent different clans and, and subgroups and so forth, uh, but they're all sort of tied together. And it's a really sort of striking visual example of a, where my dissertation quite some time ago focuses on the effort by the indigenous Aka to create a, a larger translocal identity that um, transcends some of the national but also religious borders that have, that have divided this, this particular Aka world um, in space and place. So let me begin um, the talk in this particular area. So in this paper, I reflect on the meanings and significances of what I refer to as ancestral presences with respect to the interwoven arts of living and dying in a cross-cultural perspective. I draw on certain indigenous perspectives in my own life experiences as a non-indigenous teacher and student, 
um, in considering what I see as the great potential for a broader cultural movement of ancestral resurgences to restore balance and sanity to the human and more than human world. Um, as the indigenous Dagara healer and, and shaman and teacher Maladoma Pachi Some of West Africa, um, Burkina Faso, argues unless the relationship between the living and dead is in balance, chaos results, end quote. Now I wanna begin um, with a quote from Italian anthropologist, uh, Luisa Cortese's, and this is, this is from a deep and moving reflection entitled, What Will Italy Become Without Its Elders? And this is from April, 2020. She writes, our elders taken away like the air, this disease steals. This is COVID-19, obviously. What we will miss the most once we emerge from this and start all over is our elders, whose dedication is carved in everything we have to rebuild, end quote. You know, we are facing a global pandemic that is not only resulting in the loss of life, especially among our elders, but also disrupting everyday flows of social life the world over. On the upside, the impacts of COVID-19, I say, are dealing a serious blow to the now global and increasingly tenuous political economic system of capitalism. In response, some of us are seeking out, demanding, putting into practice other ways of being that are more just, equitable, sustainable, and humane. Um, and this is in relation to the human, but also the more than human worlds as well. Others are reluctant, right, to change or only further entrenching themselves in unjust, inequitable, unsustainable political economic systems and ways of life uh, from which they nevertheless benefit or at least believe that they benefit. Um, and I would say on the down yet upside, the impacts of COVID-19 are also revealing to many of us just how vulnerable and utterly dependent we are on each other and this more than human world. COVID-19 is also forcing many of us, um, I would say, to re-examine the already uneasy yet often repressed anxieties surrounding how and why we relegate our elders, and in some cases they relegate themselves, to the sidelines of contemporary social life, whether that takes the forms of uh, happy-go-lucky 55-plus-year-old communities in the U.S., for example, where elders go to play for the rest of their lives if they can afford to do so, or miserable and depressing nursing homes where they are simply waiting uh, for the end. Now, the sense of misery and isolation experienced by the latter elders of course, in facing them was only exacerbated by the lockdowns imposed on nursing homes, um, corresponding spikes in cases across the board of individuals infected with COVID-19 required to either self-quarantine or fight this invisible enemy from the sterile, isolating rooms of hospital ICUs. Many of us are now more acutely aware of the need not only for each other, especially in facing the end, but also for ritual, right? For coming together collectively to verily celebrate and mourn while marking the passage of individuals from one social status to another uh, in the form of birth rituals as baptism, coming of age rituals, such as high school graduations or end of life rituals, such as funerals, uh, cremations and burials. Now the forced and abrupt absence of these communal rites in our lives during the COVID-19 era, um, I believe has made all of us or many of us more sensitive just how important they are in our lives and in the lives of our families and communities. Um, to reference um, the late uh, deceased, now deceased wife of Maladoma Prachi Somme, Sobonfu Somme, who writes about the centrality of ritual to the art of living and dying for many indigenous peoples. Um, this is beautifully captured in this phrase here. A child in Africa is born with ritual and dies with ritual. Your life is committed to rituals. We often say in my tradition, you're either doing a ritual, thinking about getting into one, in the middle of one, or just finished. The purpose is to connect us to our own essence, to help us tune into the collective spirit or to mend whatever is broken, whatever wires have been pulled out of one's life so we can start anew. Ritual is to the soul um, what food is to the physical body. Now, in the West, this heightened awareness of and concern for community and ritual further parallels a major resurgence in what I see as the search for ancestral roots and genealogies, right? That challenges these false yet very still widespread views of the West as the best in a sense, but also as an eminently modern space devoid of either kinship or religion. Um, in the meantime, uh, many indigenous communities the world over continue to find great meaning and strength in their sustained yet dynamic relationships with their ancestors, uh, even as they face great adversities in their respective decolonizing movements or indigenous resurgences geared towards restoring, vitalizing deep connections to place, culture, and community um, inclusive of the ancestors. This image here um, is from a small rural village in Southwest China. I, I took the photo in December 20, 2017, and it was a, um, the first time in about 50, 60 years that the villagers had carried out a formal ancestor offering um, uh, in, in had, at an altar 
And then they have this, this uh, context right here, what you're seeing are eight of the elderly um, female clan elders who are seated around a table and the villages will now be coming through shortly after I took this photo to receive their ancestral offering food from one of these various elders in this particular context. So it's a vibrant cultural vitalization movement that is taking place among indigenous Aka, I should say, in Southwest China. Okay. On first impression, it, it appears paradoxical that the more we humans are involved in each other's lives, the more effective we are in letting go of each other in the end, which for many is simply a new beginning. Now to expand on this, I would say, the more we are involved in each other's rites of passage through the life cycle within some sort of cultural framework, the more fully we are able to mourn and celebrate while marking the final rite of passage of our loved ones. In a sense, the more effective we are, even though it's so difficult, in letting go of them and reintegrating ourselves and each other into the torn fabric of everyday life that our deceased loved ones leave behind. This is even as some of us continue to relate to them in their newly transformed status as ancestors. And it's cultural frameworks, of course, for living and dying, uh, for celebrating, mourning various rites of passage that provide a crucial means by which we may truly come to know, embrace, mourn, and celebrate the intertwined arts of living and dying. And this, this kind of, for me at least, begs the question of whether this, the Western desire to reconnect with ancestors is a product of this strong sense of alienation that many in the West feel with respect to each other, their elders and their elders turned ancestors. Um, for me, this strong sense of alienation is most acutely reflected in the little or no space and time given to those who are dying and to marking their final rite of passage in the interest of keeping on in this great rat race of uh, study, work, consumption, endless achievement, which coupled with the doctrine of meritocracy and the American dream, of course, I would say forms the core of the, um, excuse me, the religion of American capitalism as we know it today. Uh, yet those who are dying um, include not only the elderly and the sick, but all of us, as in the words, I'm gonna to refer to the Canadian spoken word artist, um, Shane Khoisan, who writes, you are dying, don't panic. In this, we are equal, regardless of race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, political linen, uh, preference of music or favorite shape of animal cracker. We are dying. Our differences in thought, manner and action cannot relieve us from the obligation of our death. Whether dignified or ridiculous, dying will happen with or without our acceptance. I would check out Shane's work sometime, very powerful uh, young man. In short, we are all living and dying. And whether acknowledged or not, we and those we identify as our kinfolk, right, emotionally and symbolically live each other's lives and die each other's deaths. And this is building off of some recent work by Marshall Solons on kinship, what it is and is not. And so it is more accurate to say the little time we give to each other is only amplified in the case of those who are more properly dying and in relation to whose impending deaths, we tend to have a more urgent sense of time and its perceived end. Now I wanna go on thinking about my, my role as an educator. Um, so in two, the past, well, not the past two years, but two years prior to coming to Northern Illinois, Northern Illinois I was teaching um, a large undergraduate course on death and dying, a cross-cultural perspective at um, the State University in upstate New York. This is SUNY Oswego. Um, and in that, in, by teaching that class, I learned from my thoughtful, soul-searching students that they often come away from the course with deeper insights into not only the art of living, I mean, the art of dying, but also the art of living. Uh, in one respect, my students and I generally agree that our fears of death and dying are often rooted in a deep-seated fear of not having truly lived, failing to follow our bliss, in the words of Joseph Campbell. On the flip side, many of my students stressed that their widespread lack of direct experience with the dying and with death more broadly equates into a deep-seated fear and denial of death and dying, a fear we often concluded that ultimately prevents them from truly living. When asked about their relationships with elders and ancestors, many but not all commented that while their interactions with their elders were often few and far between, they generally had little or no knowledge whatsoever with respect to their ancestors, especially those predating um, their grandparents' generation. Some had not yet attended a funeral. A smaller subset had yet to experience the loss of a, of a close loved one in their 20s. Uh, some students noted they had, had a lot, they had lost a significant loved one as a child, uh, most often a grandparent, but many of them said their parents did their best to keep the reality of that loved one's process of dying and ultimate death a secretive and almost taboo topic in their best interest. For these students, rather, their first direct experience of death and dying often came about as a result of the loss of a beloved cat, dog, or a hamster, or some other uh, non-human animal. Uh, many of my students further attributed the widespread and seemingly growing fear and denial of death and dying in a broader US society to an even deeper seated fear of being forgotten either upon passing away or shortly thereafter. 
In fact, one of our most one of our most lively class discussions that we had was one in which they shared their respective plans for living in a manner that might render themselves memorable, unforgettable, right, to those uh, their loved ones that they leave behind. And we were talking about Robert J. Lift and Eric Olson's categories of symbolic immortality, biological, creative, theological, natural, and experiential. We further discussed this um, in a more poignant manner while reading and discussing. Uh, an immensely popular book by Mitch Album called Tuesdays with Maury. Uh, it was reprinted the second edition in 2017, originally 1997. Uh, in that book, Album recounts his last class on Tuesdays with his old university professor, Coach Maury Schwartz, who was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, now, apart from noting that either reading or rereading this book, many of them had read this book in younger, in younger, younger days, that it fundamentally changed their views on the intertwined arts of living and dying, Many found the new afterword to the 20th anniversary edition profound in highlighting that for Mitch, at least what seemed um, to trouble Maury the most about his impending death, in death was the possibility of being forgotten. Okay, the possibility of being forgotten. Um, on a further personal note, in my own some 42 odd years of life experience as an adult child of divorce several times over an academic nomad who has moved more times across and within continents that I can count on my two hands, I've long been aware of the importance of community and its active regenerative ground of ritual performance and play. I've also come to mourn the urgent lack of elders in my own cultural upbringing. Um, this is due to the relatively early passing of my paternal grandparents and the long-term absence of my maternal grandparents who, not unlike many others in their generation, moved to, to Florida, sunny Florida in search of a better life, um, hoping to leave their past lives and unfortunately many of the people inhabiting those past lives behind them as well. Now the last area that I wanna to touch on is um, my interactions and, and interactions as a student with certain indigenous peoples who refer to themselves as the Aka. Uh, so in my roughly 15 years of experience to date, interacting with learning from certain indigenous peoples, um, namely those who refer to themselves as the Aka, uh, the people of the middle, residing in the Sino-Southeast Asian borderlands, I gradually came to see and practice and thus more deeply appreciate the crucial roles that community and ritual, however imperfect and contested play, in providing a basic cultural framework for how to go about these highly intertwined arts of living and dying. Um, in brief, the Aka are Tibeto-Burman uh, speaking group with long diverse histories of migration, settlement, community formation, um, currently number roughly 700,000 individuals residing throughout this mountainous borderland regions of North Thailand, East Myanmar, uh, Burma, Southwest China, Northwest Laos and uh, Northwest Vietnam. Um, and they refer to this region, this larger region as the Aka world in short. Now, by directly participating um, in, everyday li in the everyday lives of indigenous Aka communities and households for whom extended intergenerational family living units are the norm, often with three to four generations present in the same household, I gradually came to appreciate the presence of elders in the lives of their descendants and vice versa. Even as I witnessed you know, tensions and conflicts that arose within these intergenerational households where kinship as mutuality of being operates at its best and its worst. Um, indeed, many in the West uh, vainly dismiss the power and centrality of kinship as mutuality of being in their own social lives on account of a widespread a perception of kinship, and we could say religion or even culture for that matter, is not only of the past, but also primitive, um, oppressive and antithetical to the supposedly free modern self, even as they find it of exotic interest and occasionally worthy of study from a distance. Now, through my interactions with certain indigenous Aka communities, I further came to recognize and more deeply appreciate the power of religion and its active ground of ritual when understood and practiced as community work more so than orthodoxy to maintain, transform, and ultimately sustain relations between and among the human and the more than human worlds, even as it works to resolve the many tensions and conflicts that arise along the way. This community work is work in which everyone, and I mean everyone, participates in some way, whether it be young women cleaning, preparing vegetables for a household feast, young men butchering, distributing meat from a slaughtered uh, water buffalo in a funeral uh, context, an elderly female shaman calling on the ancestor to, to help alleviate uh, their descendant's illness, or an elderly male ritual reciter priest guiding the deceased back up to the ancestral village. Um, these practices, which often take place in polychronic right, rather than monochronic fashion, not only serve as public and symbolic manifestations of the larger social fabric in the Geertsian sense, but also serve to weave and reweave that very fabric in a manner that contributes towards the continuation of the lines in the indigenous Aka sense, even as individuals, families, and communities actively modify and adapt those lines to their changing circumstances. 
I recall one Aka elder, um, a highly respected female shaman, who I, re I refer to as grandma, grandmother shaman, as, as I would in the Aka language, re recognizing her position, but also the age status, um, from a mountain village in rural North Thailand, telling me and my wife one afternoon about her and her fellow villagers' efforts to maintain, in her words, their absolutely vital connections to the ancestors by way of carrying tall, in, in the Aka language, their ancestral ways, and thus maintaining the ancestral lines or lineages. Grandmother Shaman further spoke of the many challenges facing her community as a result of the ongoing breakdown of their ancestral ways. She attributed this breakdown to a general loss of their autonomy in relation to the central Thai state and also a rising intra-village trend of outward religio-cultural conversion, especially the different Christian denominations. As a result, she commented, the village had been fragmented, in, in, fragmented into distinct religio-cultural factions, many of which um, effectively abandoned or discarded the ancestors, and this, she emphasized, has had disastrous consequences for the overall health and well-being of the community, inclusive of the more than human world. Now, as a highly respected and often called upon healer, regardless of, you know, folks, even folks who had converted to Christianity often would seek her out if they were Catholic openly, but if they were non-Catholic Protestant, they would do it in secret secrecy. Uh, she was well aware of the many challenges facing her community and the intertwined social, physical, spiritual, and environmental factors contributing to the illnesses she was being asked to diagnose. Uh, with the crucial help of the ancestors and her own parallel partner or husband that she referred to in the ancestral world that she traveled to or in the Aka conceptions died to each time that she went into trance in Aka, this is Nifashia. Uh, in short, she asserted the larger village is no longer receiving its, pro its um, absolutely vital flow of life-giving energy or blessings in Aka Gulan from the ancestors as a direct result of their abandon abandonment by many of the villagers. For grandmother, shaman, and other, other traditionalists in the village, it is the ancestors who, when properly remembered and honored, ensure their descendants receive the proper, proper flow of life-giving energy or gulong, and thus for their work to ward off or counter the life-draining effects of various hidden or unseen malevolent forces manifest in illness, poverty, and disaster more broadly. Now, I don't have time, uh, adequate time to fully discuss this matter here. Grandmother, shaman, and some of her fellow villages are working to redress these issues by both maintaining their everyday ancestral ways to the best of their abilities and also actively and consciously vitalizing those ancestral ways via a process of creative production and ethical judgment so as to ensure the ancestors remain always living and thus of moral significance for their descendants or the living living. Um, their engagements in this way are thus as much about the present and the future as the past. Um, and, and on a side note, they're further channeling their relatively newfound wealth, which is coming from coffee, coffee production into these vitalization efforts. Uh, even as this newfound wealth has brought in new forms of market, um, state, and climate-driven controls and, and vulnerabilities. Uh, their efforts can be seen as part of a broader global trend of indigenous resurgences, whereby indigenous communities are working from the grassroots level to restore and vitalize their deep connections to place, culture, and community, thereby actualizing their distinct visions of indigenous autonomy on the ground. And I think in the interest of time here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead because I see that I'm almost at 20 minutes. Um, I think I'm going to jump to the conclusions. I don't want to take any more time. And I'm just going to scan. These are some, some more images from the indigenous sort of vitalization movements taking place in this particular village. Uh, this is an offering made to um, the spirit owners of the land, the skies, and the waters, um, kind of on the perimeter of the village. It may speak to some of the shrines that, were, that um, Lisa was talking about in the Cambodian context as well. OK. And this, I wanted to also talk a little bit about um, the sort of the burgeoning movement in the United States and other parts of the world as well to, um, to, to reassert autonomy and control over various aspects of the life, life process from both birth and also to death. Um, so thinking about the home birthing movement, birth doulas, uh, death doulas, um, natural burials and so forth, sort of connecting that in many ways, thinking about this, what is all I see as being a part of this broader movement towards um, ancestral resurgences. Um, so in conclusion, what I would argue is that the COVID-19 pandemic has only heightened the sense of urgency many have long felt in the West with respect to their neglected or discarded elders and long forgotten ancestors, even as their ancestral presences continue to be felt in subtle and not so subtle ways. Now, one of the most basic yet profound insights coming out of the phenomenological turn in the social sciences is that we humans are inherently intersubjective beings who experiences, all of our experiences form and shape us into who we are for better or worse. I would argue it's time to expand this insight to include within this range of experiences the broader and deeper range of intergenerational legacies or ancestral presences 
that variably shape and form the very fields of experience into which we are born and in relation to which we participate intrinsically in each other's existence as members of one another. And last but not least, I strongly believe this broader cultural movement of ancestral resurgences uh, that I have but briefly touched on has great potential for restoring balance and sanity to the many human and more than human worlds that we co-inhabit and call home. And I will end there and introduce the next speaker. So last but not least, our the final, final speaker in the panel is um, soon to be Dr. Eugenie Clement um, from the School for Advanced Studies in Social Science in, in Paris, France. And the title of the paper, if I have it here, my page got cut off. I just have the last part. The title of the paper. It's okay. I can... Can, can you? Okay. I had the last part. So, okay. Sure, sure. You got it. You got it. Take it away. All right. Okay, so hi everyone. And uh, my name is Eugenie Clément. So I'm a PhD candidate in uh, social anthropology in uh, UHSS French Paris. So this paper, this presentation is part of uh, a work in progress. I'm uh, working on my PhD uh, dissertation. So since 2016, I work on the, the Navajo Nation located in the, the southwest of the USA, between the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. It's the largest uh, indigenous uh, nation in the United States. And I work with different groups involved in uh, environmental justice, farmers, water protectors, land defenders, academics, and um, anti-capitalist political organization. I work with a group of around 30 people and uh, in the last five years, I have seen an evolution in talks and what seems like a politicization. Um, the younger generation of adults living on the Navajo Nation seems to be more openly politicized than their older relatives. They openly call themselves anarchist or communist, always within a denialance. They see themselves as first and foremost diné who uses all the political tools they need to fight capitalism and what they see as environmental racism. So these caretakers of the land and the, of the people grant the practices in indigenous socialism, that is using the tools of the revolutionary left to get rid of the ongoing colonization, exposing internal class struggles and the theft of resources in order to have their sovereignty back. Here again, um, it's highly complex and testimonies differ between the older generation rejecting all form of ism, I mean, communism, socialism, even capitalism, and uh, the younger one. So in this presentation, I will detail how the DNA environmentalist, water protectors and land defenders um, use both DNA fundamental uh, laws and uh, leftist theories to live dignified life. For that, I will first introduce the key concept of que and ojo as the moral compass my interlocutor used to reach the horizon of freedom. Secondly, um, I will present indigenous socialism via the material condition and the structures of power happening on the Navajo Nation. And uh, the last part of my presentation will focus on my practice uh, as a European white anthropologist working with indigenous activists and farmers by looking at how we build a relationship of trust and responsibility. So the concepts of key emojo. For my interlocutors, a good life is a life in balance. And this central concept, I was taught, as I was taught by a Diné educator, can only be named in ceremonies. But I am allowed to use the concept of key emojo, not the global concept, but some of them. So for the Navajo, Ojo expresses the intellectual notion of order, the emotional state of happiness, the physical state of health, the moral condition of good, and the aesthetic dimension of harmony. The other major concept is Ke. It is a Navajo system of clans based upon the four original clans 
created by the Navajo holy figure of changing woman. It's a system of relationship that connects every form of life, a core value of interdependency. It is the, philo the philosophical principle of Ojan was for um, Dr. Larry Emerson, a living paradigm. He was a teacher and role model for many of my friends. He rejected the European concept of sovereignty. And for him, the goal of a dine centered sovereignty led to Ke and Ojo. And in this photo, you can see a community garden in uh, Lepton, Arizona, and it's a demonstration site. So just transition. The role of the farmer in political structures have considerably expanded since I first went to the Navajo Nation during the winter 2016. They are living a life of almost self-sufficiency on Dina lands, teaching their fellow members how to plant. Just like they are solicited on social media during COVID times, they themselves learned with educators like their Larry Emerson. A genealogy of resistance is visible. Quoting the farmer and educator, Nate Etiti, that I interviewed last summer, late Dr. Emerson, when I heard what he was doing at his farm, I was just blown away. When he explained to me all these structures, I was just blown away by the system. Larry Emerson had been practicing permaculture for a while. He had an established system. I was like, this is what I want. This is for our people, not only our people. This is a solution for poverty here. In the same way, I have seen a true freeing of speech from dissident individual. Farmers have gained a social and political status. When I first stayed at the Ogan of Tyron, a farmer in, 20, in 2016, he told me, I talk too much for Navajo. That's why I'm in trouble. And yet, year after year, now I see the house changing, fields getting bigger. There are now two hoop houses and a place to grow seeds, a outside kitchen with an oven. His place has become a demonstration site. He's interviewed via Facebook. He put educational material. He answered question. His videos are teaching by basic principles of farming for people on a very tight budget. He is part of a web of indigenous farmers exchanging seeds, trees, water catchment system, and so on. So in this photo taken uh, last uh, summer, you can see rainwater catchment system. They were almost, they are almost ready to function. So in the Navajo Nation, almost uh, most old, old farmers included a few or no access to running water. So this water catchment system were installed um, in different houses. The material were gifted by an NGO and installed, and installed by a team of land defenders. So nowadays, indigenous socialism has places to express itself both on the Navajo Nation and in cities around like Albuquerque, Flagstaff, and Gallup. The K Info Shop was created in 2017 in Windsor Rock, the capital of the Navajo Nation. It is a collective of self-titled Dine leftists. For them, anarchism has indigenous roots, and their tenacious resistance to colonization was in part due to a headless structure. The Care Info Shop has a library, a coffee shop. It is a place where conferences are held. Live music is played, generation meet and exchange. It's a place of liberation, a place where one can educate herself, himself, question. And it's also a place where unsheltered relatives can receive warm food and care. So the photo on the bottom uh, was taken from the Instagram account with the permission of uh, the Dine photographer, Anna Manuelito. It was taken during a, a punk rock show in uh, July 2018 at the Info shop. Uh, and the band is a Dine band called Widrat. If you look closely at this picture, you will read on the wall, K does not discriminate. The fundamental concept of K serves as a moral compass to the info shop and all the people coming through it. And on the top, you can see a photo of uh, the food box we were delivering to um, positive, COVID positive household with the mutual aid group. So people were contacting them by phone, mail, or via the local tribal structures. So the material conditions and structures of power 
Before the American conquest and the deportation of the Dine and Fort Sumner, the land was held communally and the political leadership was not coercive. From an Anglo-American point of view, there were three problems with traditional indigenous leadership. Communal ownership of all land and religious structures were preventing their, their sale and commodification. Political decisions were made by mutual consent procedure and a lack of central hierarchy authority. There was a lack of central hierarchical authority. So as the Diné historian Jennifer Denetel wrote, the Diné history is similar to those of indigenous, other indigenous people in the struggles our leaders and citizens face. And that is, it began with an imposition of foreign forms of government, judicial system, and leadership. Today, the Navajo Nation lacks basic infrastructures, such as running water. Approximately 33% of the inhabitants don't have running water nor electricity. This is part of a history of ongoing colonialism and the battle around Dine water resources between the tribes and the states surrounding it. As Dine geographer Andrew Curley states, the water settlements have had the effects of denying critical water infrastructures to Dine communities until the Navajo Nation agrees to settle its claim to the Colorado River. For Dr. Curley, this is part of a coal energy water nexus. And on this photo, you can see the material condition on the Navajo Nation. The absence of paved road complicates any travel. So this was taken at the peak of summer 2020. Some houses become unreachable due to a lack of infrastructure, infrastructures, and therefore they can't reach any help. So the current political structures of the Navajo Nation were created in 1923 when prospectors found oil in the Dine grounds. My interlocutors wonder who their government is really working for. This image, as you can see on the left, has been circulating in social media since 2017. Through political organizations like the Kainfo Shop, they find what they say to be a political dignity. It allows them to be at the service of the people and on the front line. Many of them, if not all, went to Standing Rock in 2016 in what seems to have been a call for a whole generation. They are fighting to recover their sovereignty and for them, it starts with regaining control over their food system, the season and management of the land, their water, their food, and their political and economical organization. A series of delusions have changed farmers' attitude toward the governments. When I interviewed a Dine farmer last summer on this topic, his answer was, I think the Navajo Nation government is like a subsidiary just a small branch of her largest branch. I think our Navajo Nation government is inept. It should be teared down and rebuilt in our own indigenous Dine point of view, rather than try to work with a government that was set up for us. It will make more sense if the people were guided by the people, the mother, the matriarchs, the people who actually know the land and their family. So we're under the illusion that our colonial government will save us. NGOs and their vertical model of power, along with the tribal government, were criticized heavily during this last summer. Those producing goods and knowledge were not paid nor considered, yet they are the one changing the system of production and therefore the revolutionary actors. In the office, directors and communicators were receiving high salaries and rewards while farmers and protectors on the ground seven days a week weren't even compensated for their mileage. More seriously still, a clash with the office, frontline workers had to leave the house where they were working. The community garden where corn was growing was destroyed, breaking one of the most sacred Dine fundamental law, destruction of life itself. So this is a post from an Instagram from one of uh, the person belonging to the mutual aid group um, 
built by the K Info shop. I'm of course using this photo with the permission. And the NHA is a Navajo housing authority. And the house where mutual aid stock the produces and we're doing the work was or belonged to the NHA. So this series of events demonstrate the difference of perceptions towards the land between Navajo political infrastructures such as NHA and mutual aid group built around consensus, like they came to shop. Are these tribal institution helping to produce what Sarah called colonial scape? Can we speak of class struggle? As one farmer told me this summer, I don't believe there is a way to fix this system. I don't care who promises to do what. I don't think there is any way to fix a system that isn't broken. It's functioning the way it's supposed to function. And if we want to actual change, we have to create our own system, not in competition, just in doing, you know? We got to create our own system. And when it becomes so successful, the people on the other side will come and be part of the change. Dine farmers working towards food sovereignty have seen a major increase in demands and of seeds and knowledge about planting and gardening since the start of the pandemic, in last, like a year ago in March 2020. There is a consensus that this has been a sort of wake up call, an urgent need to be self-sufficient and provide for the family. As Felix Earl, a farmer and educator recall, instead of trying to make changes halfway across the world, I find it best by, you know, I should try to make these changes with myself first and in my own, and then in my surroundings, and then in my family, and then in my community. So in the process of trying to change things, change the world, I'm changing myself too. And on top of that, I noticed a bunch of new people were interested. I keep just encouraging people who kind of feel out of it. I continue to tell them, this is just a hump so that we're going over. It's not gonna last for long. To keep going, you know, to keep that strike. We're actually starting to see ripple effects. So who knows? Maybe in our lifetimes, I'm in my mid, mid 40s now, but by the time I'm in my 80s, we will have started a big revolution. So even if farmers don't explicitly talk about their work as socialism, communism, or anarchism, they are working for the betterment of the material, physical, and mental condition of the people. They work toward revolutionary goals. For them, it means the end of capitalism and ongoing colonization. In that, they joined the global movement fighting ecological upheaval. So let me please now finish um, this, pre this presentation by focusing on the web of relationship I have established on the Navajo Nation. This has led me to examine the vocabulary that we use when we relate to each other. We talk to each other as relatives, um, and I have been included in a circle of responsibility with words like family, my relative, comrade, homie, sister. My intentions are to get out of a capitalist relationship where my interlocutors are producing the knowledge I extract without giving anything back. Being in a circle of responsibility mean also at times being reminded when it's not the proper time to ask for information. Learning that there are times where knowledge is lived and times when knowledge is shared not all knowledge has to be shared. Knowledge extraction is a harsh truth that could maybe be included in the circle of what is seen as capitalist predatory relationship. Do not extract knowledge from my relatives, a dinner friend told me once as a joke, but like any joke, there is a truth behind it. And I was taught something, extractive economy has penetrated into every industry. The words were telling me something about the social climate on the Navajo Nation. A fear of being dispossessed, not only of the land, but of words, of memories, and of the necessity to tell your story with your, your own words. Some summers ago, one of my friends gave me corn seeds from her garden at Navajo Station. I planted the seeds in my mother's gardens. They grew big and tall. We now have plenty more dinner seeds. I find beauty and hope in these small acts. Out of neoliberal dogmas, how relationship fall within the multiple, the proliferation and the rhizome. So in a time of ecological upheaval, we are building bridges. Thank you.
All right, thank you, Jeannie, for an excellent paper to finish off the panel. Uh, we have about, we have until, I'm central, central time here in the Midwest, so I'm 145, I think you're 245 on the East Coast, and I don't know where you are in the Pacific and other parts of the world, but um, maybe we can start with a question for Eugenie, since you just finished. There's a, you see the question in the chat box that Mark had uh, copied from Coralina Picos, do the Navajo have a little more hope with Biden to see their rights change? Um, no, I don't see the question, but I will answer it, yeah. So um, there is a little bit more hope, but the, honestly, the farmers and the um, different activists I'm working with are just like disillusioned. Like, the only kind of little hope they've seen is with the uh, nomination of Deborah Allen, you know, as a, as a secretary of, uh, of uh, Interior. I can, like, I've heard from a lot of people that this is an important thing for them. It's a big deal. Even if they have little hope in this system, it's like, at least this is something, you know, representation matter for little kids and for young adults. It's important for them, they're visible. <laughs> It's kind of something to see as a, a little revolution, but they're like, we will see because every time we have high expectations and then nothing changed. So we'll see. <laughs> there is another question for Lisa from Jeff McDonald. Uh, was the area mined by the Khmer Rouge? And if so, how did the spirits react to this? Similar issues of the effects of road and railroad development in China are being reported due to the damage done to dragon lines of Feng Shui. Uh, there was considerable opposition to railroad tunneling in 19th century China. Folks, if you could put some of this into the Q&A box, it would make it a bit easier. Um, but, so if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A box rather than the chat box. But Lisa, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Um, yeah, you, Jeff, for that question. I need to follow up on your comment. I don't know much about railroad tunneling in 19th century China. Dragons under the earth is common across Southeast Asia over into China. Um, and so that would be interesting to follow up on. Yes, the area was mined by the Khmer Rouge, the Royalists, and also the Vietnamese in the 80s and 90s. Um, Work on the spirits and landmines is something I have focused on more in um, Western Cambodia, in Battambang. I've actually written a couple of papers about that. I've not done any research on the mountain directly asking about landmines. The so Western Cambodian situation, people often interpret Ma and Buddhism or to angering the spirits in the forest and then, yeah. Yes. You're breaking up a bit on my end, Lisa. So I suspect it would be similar. On yeah, I, I think I'm losing it in Borneo, Micah. <laughs> maybe some of us can put our video up, turn our video off when you're speaking. It might make it maybe less, less bombarding. Um, there's, there's no other questions that I see in the chat box, but one that I had that I think that we could all speak to um, and we can, I, you know, I'd much rather entertain questions from the audience, but let's just wait and see as they come in. Or do any of you have questions that you can, that sort of speak to cross um, paper issues? I, I have two, but I'll, I'll throw it out to, to the, my fellow panelists first. Is there any question you'd like to raise or pose? Dr. Boss, go ahead, Marjorie. Uh, I, I was very appreciative of the way these pulled together. And I'm, I'm interested in some of the gender aspects of leadership. Um, I was thinking about it when Eugenie was talking about her activists and friendships and thinking about it for your um, elders, Mika, and thinking of, of, of Lisa's material. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about the gender dynamics and whether these look more like new vitalizations or more like uh, something that is a continuation of female leadership. 
Do you, do you want to speak to that first? Because that, that's also something in your panel. Would you like me to respond? I can start. So it's a it's an important important topic. So it's very interesting because from the on the farmer side, most of, most of the farmer working on silver, on food sovereignty on the Navajo Nation I work with um, are either queer or trans, right? Um, and it's interesting because it goes back to um, the gender views on the traditional gender view from uh, on the Diné, from the Diné tradition. And uh, the mutual aid group is made of a lot of very young women, really like in their eight, in their early 20. You don't see a lot of um, men. It's really this space, this uh, the leadership, the visible face of the leadership um, is composed of young women and, um, and queer people, but also always re reclaiming this as belonging to um, traditional uh, views on gender from a Diné point of view, right? So it's, I hope I, it's, it's more clear. I'll just, uh, in, in the context that I'm working with Indigenous Aka, mm -hmm. there, um, there are new and old dimensions to these cultural vitalization projects. And it depends on the village and I worked in some sort of more conservative traditional village, others more, I don't want to say progressive, but others who were more open to actively and, and, and sometimes reforming the traditions in ways that the old traditionalists didn't even recognize it as tradition anymore. But, um, but the way gender plays in is an interesting sense because the Aka um, are patrilineal and generally wives, women marry into their husbands' households. And the genealogical tradition is, uh, the naming tradition is primarily through the males, but um, when you're making ancestral offerings, they include at least the, the, the three closest to seven generations of uh, ancestors as couples, right? The husband and wife sort of couplets going out. And the flow of gulong for a, for a particular household fundamentally depends on um, have maintaining good relationships with the wife sides of the family, especially through the mothers, all the mother's brothers going back, you know, multiple generations. So there's that. But that being said, one aspect um, that, that's pretty interesting for me is there is um, there's a movement on the part of some Aka, especially those who are more open to, to actively modifying and reforming traditions to allow for the naming tradition to be carried on through mothers, as opposed to specifically through fathers, and to allow in the cases where, for example, a family does not have a son to, who will inherit the household and carry out the, out the, the ancestral offering at the altar, to allow for that to be done in the case where there's only daughters for example, um, and even to allow, in some contexts, to allow for daughters or women to, to carry out, to make the final ancestral offering. It's, it's often done as a couple, the husband and wife, the head of the, the household, um, but ultimately it is the male head, head of the household who places the uh, ancestral offering table at the foot of the altar, um, sign on these sort of sits down, says whatever they have to say, calls upon the ancestors, and, and then the meal is fed to the rest of the family. So, so there are some really interesting um, gender dynamics to these, these re reformations of these ancestral ways. Am I still frozen? <laughs> okay. You're back. Um, on Kulen, the diviners and the mediums are almost completely women. But it's an interesting question, Marjorie. I don't, I assumed that was a continuation, but I actually haven't asked. Um, the Krusada, tend to be men, which I think is because they often chant in Pali and they learn that often from Buddhist monks. So some of them are men who came out of the monastery and returned to village life. But I'm curious about your, your shamans in the Siberian example. Uh, they both were women, the photos you showed. Yeah. Well, in some of that? the more traditional uh, forms, the more revered and legendary shamans were men. Uh, and I, I think there, there has been a feminization process of leadership going on, but not in a hardened way. It's, it's flexible, it's adaptive. And one of the reasons for that, frankly, is also Soviet legacy, where they really repressed the higher profile guys and some of the women were able to continue underground. 
Some men did, but some men especially uh, were were more caught up in in the Soviet repressions and killed even. Uh, the issue, though, for current day is a a new and maybe you could even call it democratization of spirituality, which I think is is multi gendered and accepting and uh, and and fascinating. Uh, I also really am struggling and have been for many, many years with this uh, tension between vitalization and revitalization because of the Soviet period being so repressive and so blatantly repressive. I, I started realizing that I had to use revitalization a lot of the time, but that didn't mean that there wasn't some continuity. So it's a it's a balancing act how we think of these things. And the the gender part of this is just one part of the more complex flows of it that's not yes, no, or either or. Marjorie, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the comparative context of China. Um, and I'm in the, the photos that I showed you of that small village level re slash vitalization of this New Year ancestral offering. There were some in the village who were against it. And they, they didn't even show up for the ancestral um, the right because some thought it was just a waste of time. Others were concerned that they had lived through the Cultural Revolution, and they were concerned that it was going to it was going to bring you know some some iron fist down upon the village, and um, and and then others were concerned that in if they didn't do it properly, if they didn't carry out the rites properly according to the ways of the ancestors, they might also bring harm from the ancestors in terms of you know the, the fear of offending the ancestors. So there's all these layers of complexity, but some of it comes out of that. That, that, that socialist context as it was manifest in China. Um, so there's a comparative focus there, thinking about that. But I guess I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how folks on the ground would see it and understand it. Um, and, it's, and I found that, a lot, as you mentioned, a lot of these practices were driven underground. So the village, I mean, since at least since they started to have some economic wealth coming in from rubber primarily, they've been feasting. Feasting is okay. And they've been feasting during during the occasion of the new year, and people will talk about that feasting using the same language they used in the past. They will say we're the upper log, which is we're making an offering to the ancestors without the ancestor altar and without any kind of formal offering being made. So there's continuity yet this continuity, I think. Now it's just be, it's now they actually reinstalled an altar at the village level, um, but how those those historical legacies play into the present moment. Yeah, I think also, Eugenie, you mentioned that there's lots of youth involved in these movements. I was curious what the elders think of those movements in your amongst on the Navajo reservation. Well, at the center of it is a question of violence. No. Mm -hmm. So I see the and I see and I hear the younger generation saying like violence can be legitimate sometimes. It's not the goal to be violent, but if, if it serves the purpose of ending colonization, of gaining rights, of uh, liberation, it's another tool that should be considered. So some elders are not very okay with that. It's the main like friction that arise sometimes, like how to deal with violence. But again, it's it's, it's really complex as every time there are like social interaction because some elders resisted relocation on Black Mesa, firstly, like with, with gun. And, and, there, and there are like um, models for a lot of the younger generation now, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's complex. And also what the elders like, um, they blame the young generation for not speaking uh, the Nebisat, the Navajo language, or not knowing uh, the proper ceremonies. But the younger generation, like they, they tell me, like, but we didn't make this choice. We didn't choose that. We weren't taught this thing. So sometimes we feel like we're like treated like five years old um, kids when we are 20, 25, but we, we didn't have these educational tools. 
because of boarding school, because of uh, forced Christianity, because of relocation. Uh, we have lost uh, contact with the sacred sites. Many elders also passed away. And that was also a big fear during the Navajo Nation. Like a lot of places, like you say, Mika, like elders are also a library. They're living proofs. They are, they, they, they are the knowledge. So every time elders die, it's a tragedy because each elder has a special knowledge. They know ceremonies, they know songs. So it's always embedded in a, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of complexity. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Can I follow up or do we have other questions in the Q and A? I don't I, see anything yet, Marjorie. So I, I was also very disturbed when I um, understood that there had been a community garden that was actually destroyed. And I know that Eugenie, you didn't have the time to talk about it, but indeed sacred cord being destroyed is, is mind blowing. How, what was the context for that? What happened? So there was, like I said, there was a cash. So the mutual aid group uh, started first, you know, as spontaneously, like we need to do something. Uh, the COVID is happening and we don't have the structures, like the tribal structures will 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 take too much time. So they spontaneously organized one team, one part of the team, uh, the one with the contacts and with uh, international uh, profile, were the um, face of the mutual aid. And the other were working on the ground. Well, it was kind of how we work. So there was a clash because people like, the one on the ground um, doing all this um, manual work, like making sure the trucks are there, uh, connecting people, calling them, sanitizing everything. I haven't been paid, they weren't paid, they weren't seeing any money, they didn't have even mileage. So their anger was growing and they learned that with the money they received like from, from so it was like, um, all this money was received through a donation, right? So when they heard that people in the office decided to change their model from a mutual aid group to NGO, they were furious because nobody asked them their opinion. And then uh, they didn't receive any compensation. A lot of them were in debt or didn't have any work. So they put on their own money. And they were hosted, they were uh, hosted in a, so Navajo Housing Authority was renting them a house. So when the clash happened, the people like the face of uh, the NGO or wannabe NGO, used their contact. And so NHA didn't choose uh, the people on the ground. So in terms of power, it was clearly uh, what it has been seen like uh, oppression, oppression. And that's why they talked to me about, they, they were the ones saying, this is a class struggle. This is bougie natives, not working for the people, but working for their own uh, condition, the betterment of their condition. So the Navajo Housing Authority uh, told the, so, so the people had to leave the house. So the, I, I'm talking about the pe people from the mutual aid group. So they had to cl clean up everything. And, but they were told, that, so they grew up a community garden, but they were told that they could keep the garden because corn was growing. It was not time to, to harvest. And, uh, one, one night they went there and the corn was cut. So employees working for the tribal structures receives the order to just cut them down. And yeah, it's, it, it wasn't believable. It really, it's something, uh, it blew everyone's minds. It's something nobody thought it could happen. So that's how it happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was corn, I mean, corn on the Navajo Nation, it's like, People were like, how could you? Well, 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 who, where do you belong? Have you not grown up in this land? Like you were Diné, how can you as a Diné do that? It's... 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it just went very far. <laughs> sort of, I think expanding on that, Eugenia, something you had said earlier about um, someone saying to you, do not extract knowledge from my relatives, right? And kind of ironically, but not really ironically, mm -hmm. there's something behind it. We probably, I don't, I mean, I, have, I had a similar experience in the field as well. And for example, I was given an Aka name, which means Amu. In Mu, the second part of that means sort of good and proper and well-behaved and generally good natured. And someone made a joke and I didn't quite get it at the time saying that he's, he's good now, but he may not be good in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. And I sort of caught it later, you know, depending on, you know, the relationships there I was, I was, I was, I was working on a documentation project and uh, recording some of the vitalization efforts and so forth. But, but they were very, they had, they had dealt with anthropologists before and scholars and missionaries who had come through and extracted knowledge and converted and so on. But I wonder if each of us might speak to that, that experience of, you know, thinking about knowledge, not as a commodity, but as a gift and thinking of it as a gift, the kind of obligations, responsibilities and rights that, that come along with right. it in engaging. Yeah. One of the things I think Eugenie's case just of conflict just described is teaching us not to ever overgeneralize about a people. And not that we've done that in our generations of scholars, but but it 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 is so important to understand internal political social context and your very close friends may be allied with one group over another so in the field the complexities of your own social networks really really are important to be sensitive to i i've, I've been in the field on and off in in Sahara republic and also in two other republics of siberia buryatia and, and tiva um, for, for many, many years, but back and forth to Saha enough times that I lost count and now have Saha neighbors and friends who are very close. And so the, the networks, um, this week we're mourning one of our elders who passed away in Boston, but is part of the Saha diaspora and beloved back home. And so my inner relationships with all of these folks are just so important to maintain. Um, it is never ever possible and it's great that it isn't possible to just sort of go home from a field site and then write up your notes and say okay i'm done i mean this is not how you treat a field commitment to friends that you have made and of course you may have people who are interlocutors you may have people who are high up of informants who are just part of an interview i mean your whole range is going to be so complex in terms of uh, what your relationships are, that it would it it would be impossible to overgeneralize your own um, personal interconnections, um, and they also go back and forth over the years and change and shift in intensity. So so you have a lot to look forward to because you all three seem very embedded and very close to the people in the work that you've been doing, and that's the most beautiful gift of all. Hmm. Yeah, I feel very privileged to work with Cambodians. I, I think I am lucky because I spend a lot of my time working with elders and most of the communities I work in, they like that. <laughs> People of working age are busy, you know, trying to grow crops, trying to deal with the wage. So a lot of people talk about the elders being neglected. So I've often been told it's nice that I come and sit around and talk to old people a lot. Um, but I, I think my responsibility goes beyond that because Cambodia is also a post-war context um, and there's almost no written documentation of villages' histories or traditions or customs or stories at all. Um, so what I've tried to do with my students is to always return local language summaries back to the community heads um, what I think is interesting is it's not clear if people are necessarily excited about that now, but I, I wonder if a generation from now they will be. It depends on the village. Some villages have asked for their history back. Other villages seem a bit confused about why anyone would write it down. So it really, it really is a, a place to place, but yeah. Can I ask uh, Lisa, to what extent is, would you say that as, as a collaborative process of generating um, local histories and stories and I don't know that I would call it collaborative because it's I'm doing it through the oral history medium so you know I'm sitting with elders and we're doing very long oral histories um I 
often in small groups, which is the Kamai and the Bunong, the indigenous people I work with, the elders often like to be in small groups because they'll, you know, they'll start talking and they'll add each other's memories. And but I, I feel to call it collaborative, it would require more than what I do, which is listen, write things down. But I, I mean, I always work with local research assistants to try to help with that. But I, I think, yeah, I, I would like to think about what a more collaborative approach would look like. And I, I've been very interested in youth and whether youth are interested in listening and writing down the stories of their elders. That's quite a complicated one in Cambodia at this point in time. I was actually interested, Micah, with the Aka people, if the youth are engaged with these vitalization traditions that the elders are doing. Well, it's, it's, this is part of a larger um, trans-regional Aka sort of cultural pride vitalization movement. And, and so there's a group uh, based in Burma who are, who are bringing in um, musicians, popular musicians, almost as kinds of slogans or uh, the slogan of the movement. And so there's, a, there's a, actually a kind of heavy metal rock band called Ten Fingers. And they, they're, really, they're really good. The, the lead singer is like, he, he was like on Idol Burma, Idol Burma or something he won last year. But he had been sort of chosen as the spokesperson, him and his band for this, this new traditionalist movement based in Burma. Um, and he, he takes the themes of the movement and puts it into music about, you know, we are Aka and we carry the Aka way. We, we make offerings, we respect the ancestors. We're one, 10 Aka are one as opposed to one being 10. They have a sort of metaphor of one becoming 10 being split, but rather 10 becoming one. Um, so that's one way that they're working with you. They've also, um, uh, some of the, some of the um, younger and middle-aged folks um, who are literate in Thai or Chinese or, or Burmese and some even in English, they, they developed a common writing system and they mostly have been teaching, targeting younger youth and, um, and, and, and ironically, in, in a way, they, they received a, a grant from the U.S. Ambassadors Fund, the embassy in Bangkok to do a cultural vitalization project documenting um, rituals, but also producing films and books, um, looking at children's games and sports games and teaching the mm -hmm. alphabet and so on. So, so that, that, that is making connections with youth um, throughout, throughout the region. Um, but it depends on the space, the village and the place. And it's not so easy to do, do that work in Laos, for example, in Vietnam. Um, okay. But, uh, but, but there, there are connections with the youth. They, there are. Mm -hmm. In some villages, there's a stronger connection, um, but it really varies. Really interesting. Okay, folks, that looks like we're at about time. Uh, you know, I just want to jump in here and I want to thank the panelists. Uh, and I, I just want to say a couple of things. Um, I would not have believed that this wasn't an, an organized panel ahead of time, uh, having having sat here and participated in this. And so, Micah, thank you for just an absolute pro job in navigating that and being the panel chair. And thank you to the panelists. Um, the, the way you engaged uh, not only the group and engage and, and presenting your own material, but then engaged with one another uh, was so complete and so and so captivating that I, I've been in, we've all been in a lot of these sessions. Sometimes they generate a lot of questions and a lot of activity in the chat, and sometimes they don't. One of the reasons I think they don't is when a, pre a presentation is so complete and so um, contextualized that we just get to sit back and enjoy uh, all of your uh, of your presentation and the way that they fold into one another and it gives us so much to think about and I think that's what was happening here um, and so thank you for the presentations thank you for the interaction Mark thank you for organizing the panel the way you did because that speaks a lot to your awareness of these folks and the uniqueness of their work and how it also bleeds into uh, uh, each other and so thank you all for that wonderful wonderful panel I also want to do a quick shout out to Coralina Picos, uh, Twitch TV and the Twitch TV folks. Uh, Mark has worked hard to get Twitch uh, integrated into our presentation and get these ideas out to a whole host of other folks that maybe aren't uh, primarily in academia or at least coming to us through those channels. And so welcome to the Twitch TV audience and thank you for participating there. Um, and lastly, we're gonna have a short break here and I'll throw it to Mark before we, we stop, but we're gonna be coming back with um, our screening of the film Gather on indigenous food sovereignty. It's a wonderful film and there's two components to it. The film starts at 3 p.m. Eastern time. If you look in the chat, there's information. You have to actually register for a ticket. The ticket's free, 
but you have to get the ticket because that will then email you the link to, to be able to screen the film with us. And then there's a second component starting at 4.30 Eastern time. There's a Zoom link for a Q&A with the director of the film and one of the film's participants. And so we really hope that uh, you can join us for that. And the links for that are in the chat now. And that will start at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and so we have a short break until then. So Mark, anything from you as we close out? I just wanna echo your words, Andy. Thank you so much for all of you presenting. This is an incredibly important topic and I think it will feed nicely into the gather screening that we'll be having coming up. Um, so that, um, you know, uh, we'd like you to register for that screening that helps the screeners know who's watching the movie. It's free to you, um, but that would be um, helpful for us to, to honor their work to create that uh, movie. So if you could do that, that would be great. The links are posted. Um, we'll also be simultaneously streaming that on Twitch. And um, later on, uh, we will be having our happy hour. Well, we'll have another session uh, that should be good. And then we'll be having our happy hour. And then I just wanted to point out if anyone's interested in exploring the Twitch space, it's a different non-academic space. Um, we'll be having an after party at twitch.tv backslash abracadabra. So it's a live DJ set. Um, you can come and hang out, just see what it's about. Um, I think Anna said, uh, one of our help, our help desks, uh, she said, it's another world and, and it is. So anyways, um, just wanted to give that information, but thank you again to each of our presenters, Micah, Lisa, Marjorie and Eugenie. Um, these have uh, absolutely wonderful. So um, thank you so much to everyone and we'll see you uh, in a few minutes for our, uh, our screening. And I'll say this before we close all, uh, just to just through um, a pitch for the happy hour, our evening happy hours are turning into a space where some senior anthropologists and folks who have worked with the organization for a very, very long time, 30, 40, 50 years are coming in and being able to share some really intimate and, 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 um, and meaningful stories about their life and their work and where they are now. And we've really been able to sort of create a container and hold space for that for that really sacred space. Uh, and that happened last night with Dan Mormon and some other folks. And it's going to happen again tonight. David Cole and Carrie Pitaki will be joining our happy hour later to talk about their work in the late 60s in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and they've reconnected through Anthropology of Consciousness and are excited to come join us and informally uh, have a conversation about that. So please do try to make the happy hours if you can. They're really, really great.